Welcome to News Desk on Silicon Angle TV for Wednesday, October 10th, 2012. I'm Kristen Folletti. The second annual BoxWorks Developer Conference in San Francisco wrapped up yesterday. Box CEO Aaron Levy took the stage on Monday to talk about how Box is faring against its competition. So how bright is the future for Box? Plus more on Bravo's real look at Silicon Valley and what's happening in venture capital markets. Here with his breaking analysis on today's trending stories is Silicon Angle founder John Furrier. Welcome, John. Great to see you again. Thank Good morning. You. First off, can you provide us with a quick background and overview of Box and who they are? Um, Box.net, or now called Box, is a startup, a hot startup in Silicon Valley that uh, was started by a whiz kid, Aaron Levy who now is uh, uh, all over the place in terms of you know being his own media company, tweeting, blogging. Uh, I think he's like 25 years old or something like that. Started the company in his dorm room and uh, you know classic success story, young kid disrupting existing markets. They started, got some venture funding. Now they're worth over a billion dollars in their last round of funding, raised $125 million or so, give or take a few 10 millions here and there. Um, but yeah, they, they're all about you know, five, six years old and uh, and they provide basically started out doing file sharing or FTPing files, and now that's basically called in the cloud uh, file sharing. And since then, have morphed their company from a uh, wild and crazy startup throwing keg parties to um, you know trying to seriously compete in the enterprise. And uh, you know that's a market that's growing like crazy, and they're disrupting incumbents like Microsoft. That's their was their original position, and that's their whole thing. Their whole thing is that we are the new school. We are cloud, we are file sharing in the cloud, and so Box hopes to be um, a high-flying company in the enterprise and the consumer. Box started as somewhat of a college business project in 2005, and they've seen rapid growth. And now there are even indications that the company may, may be heading towards an IPO. So is this another Facebook fairy tale story? You know, you know Box.net, uh, or Box has been over the top with PR and marketing, and you know the, the the trend in the marketplace right now is not to hype, but not to to be more humble. Um, the hype stories, uh, like with Facebook, are, are not something that that any, anyone wants to do. But Box has definitely been hyping themselves up over the past year. We've been watching them kind of uh, you know wave their hands around, trying to be relevant. And I think what's happened is in their last round of funding. And I commented this on a blog post: is they realized that they didn't have a lot of tech, and that they were just simply a uh, file sharing company in the cloud with a nice UI on it. And I think you know I'm oversimplifying it, but I think ultimately that's what the marketplace looks at Box as as a consumer company. People put down their credit cards. They have some you know, you know shadow IT go around IT buy some file sharing but you know box has almost no adoption in the enterprise they have some clients I'm sure they you know they wrestled some clients to the ground but ultimately have not been successful in the enterprise so I think they've stepped back from the whole IPO rhetoric and to build out the product and that's a smart move and my take on that that's a super smart move and the box conference that they had the uh, box uh, uh, customer event that they had was really showcasing that they have new capabilities. So they still did the old, you know, we're disrupting the incumbents like Oracle and Microsoft, but are really playing their hand into trying to be relevant and showing more depth to the product. And that's really what people have been dismissing Box as is not really a real product. But I think they're working hard to fix that. At the conference in San Francisco yesterday, CEO Aaron Levy dropped some updates on the company's growth over the last year. Uh, what kind of milestones did they reach? They um, apparently, from the reports on TechCrunch, but you know, really hard to believe what you know what's being reported there. Um, it's because again, they're marketing the hell out of their company. I mean, Box.net. It's hard to believe what's real. You know, in some of the cases there, um, but you know, apparently, from what I've found, they are doing well. They are growing. Um, they've doubled their business. They said to 140,000 customers. I think they said they had a you know a large percentage of the Fortune 500, 90 percent, something like that. Um, and doubled their user base. So this is not a company that's dying at all. I mean, I like this company. I think that, uh, you know, this college culture throwing keg parties and having a young CEO 
um, has was a good start, a good culture. And I think that you know, the, as they grow up, they do less of the keg parties, more of the you know, we're a growing young company. But you know, the health of the company is solid. The overall market segment of cloud uh, computing is growing like crazy. So again, the big action here is not so much that they have people putting their credit cards and using Box for the PTA or the soccer club. Um, it's really more about can they penetrate IT in the enterprise, and I think that's where they're going. They've hired some high-profile people, and uh, you know, from what we're hearing, they're making some progress, but not as much as they, they should be. Can you tell us how developers are interacting with Box and who some of their competitors are? I think the developers' story is new to Box, and they rolled that out. Again, I commented on this on my blog uh, when they did that. It was a good move for them. This is a good strategy for Box. They are a um, low-end company relative to the enterprise market. They're a new entrant in the market. They have to be competitive, and the only way for them to be competitive is not to take on the big boys directly. They have to create a new, a new game, a new ground game, if you will. So part of that is let's build out the technology, which they're doing and Aaron and the, and the team is doing. And the second thing is to build out the developer ecosystem. I like this move of Box. Where I'm critical of Box is I don't like the overhyping of the company. I find I feel like they're overplaying their hand, and everyone knows it. And I think that they should just stick to the fact that they have a great growing market, great team of people and engineers, and they're building out the product. So, you know, they are making some good metrics on the success. Again, my critical uh, analysis of Box is less hype, more meat on the bone. They have it, and it's a growing market, so they should just kind of throttle down the the rhetoric. So going back to what we discussed earlier, how likely does an IPO look for Box? I think it's likely, but I'm not. I don't think that's on their mind. I mean, it's the end game for the VCs. They have, uh, you know, good investors. They have big deep pockets. They got Mark Andreessen behind them. I think that that's ultimately an end game for them at some point or just a milestone. I don't think that they're engineering their company for an IPO. I thought that a year ago with all the hype and press, but given the whole IPO market, pe people in the IPO market want to see more work days, less Facebooks. So Box is vulnerable until they have the sustainable traction on the enterprise. I don't consider them an IPO candidate because the consumer market switching costs are a lot lower than the enterprise. If they can penetrate the enterprise with a good product that they're potentially saying and have a developer ecosystem, they have an opportunity to be sticking the enterprise and be nested in there, and that's a sustainable business. And if they get the kind of traction they currently have on the consumer side, uh, the percentage of the Fortune 500, that's a good play. That's a good prospect. I think they're smart to back out of the, of the IPO track and uh, hit it when they're when they're more solid on the enterprise. Yesterday, we covered the new Silicon Valley Bravo show. Uh, can you talk about how startup culture is being highlighted within the show? Yeah, I mean, I think this. First of all, the show is is ridiculous. It's it's total non. Silicon Valley. This is an actual cool show from the sense of it shows the tech culture. In fact, Mark Hopkins and I were talking about this because one of the characters uh, on there um, uh, is, is from another blog and one I know, Sarah from uh, Sarah Austin, we've not worked with in the past. These are people that are, are tech lovers, but they do not have any reality towards entrepreneurship. They've never started a company. They've been, you know, essentially running around with their cameras, you know, doing kind of the social media thing. And so, you know, two of the four people don't have any experience being an entrepreneur. So that's one issue. This is total Kardashians for Silicon Valley. I like that. I'm glad that the cameras are being turned on in a non-Valley Wag kind of way. I think it's good for the, the digital culture. I think this will be accepted. And I think what's going to happen is Bravo is going to shift the focus from um, less glamorous startup, non-real entrepreneurs and make it a little bit more real and sexier. Um, and I think one of the things they need to do is bring back a central character in the show. And, um, and I think that's something that's key. But the startup community in general in Silicon Valley is changing. The whole idea around Bravo is that people are getting money left and right. That is not true. These incubators and accelerators are hurting and, and not really doing well. Although they are making investments but they're making 800 million investments and that's just like free money and that's going to end that game is going to end as as we say that jig is almost up and that's a big problem for silicon valley yeah so for a while incubators and accelerators like y combinator they were hot and now they seem to be cooling down so what's going on there i just think that you know two things happen with this whole y combinator uh, super angel kind of micro vc thing this investment strategy is that people want to disrupt 
the marketplace, and that's just natural. And I think there's been disruption with Twitter and Facebook, but here's the problem. They're making 800 million investments, 800 investments here, and it's just too much investments. The companies don't get the mind share, they don't get the value add, and at the end of the day, it's the same business model of venture capital, one or two hits. Y Combinator showing that of, of their big successes, they're all pretty much failures except for Airbnb and Bo uh, Dropbox of which those companies are still questionable at this point. So, and they're private companies. So even though the valuations are high, they're still private companies. If you look at box.net, we were just talking about same situation, although it's a billion dollar valuation, it's still a private company. So it's still not working. People don't think it's gonna work. I think the traditional venture capital model will evolve to that low end of the market. But this is not a good sign for the ecosystem in the sense that all these startups are gonna be funded and it's gonna start drying out. Um, I think Y Combinator will be successful because of their brand, but but pretty much everyone else will dry up, in my opinion. John, real quick before you go, you're speaking on a panel today about big data monetization at the Quadris Conference Center on Sand Hill Road in Manolo Park, California. Uh, who else is going to be joining you on the panel, and what big ideas will you be discussing? Um, I'm going to be at uh, Sand Hill Road uh, in Menlo Park, which is where the center of the VC action is. And, and it's being put on by Reed Smith, a big law firm out there, uh, one of the partners over there, Bob Stefanski, ex-general uh, counsel, CFO of TIPCO, putting it on. So it's going to be Ram Men Menon, who's the president of social computing at TIPCO, MC Shrevis, the founder and CTO of MapR. Uh, which we've covered on Silicon Angle, and uh, Steve Soma, the CMO of Splunk, and myself, and we're going to talk about uh, uh, monetization, really, about the, the future of big data and where the action is. And so it's going to be fun to be on a panel where I'm not the host, um, and we're, we're going to be talking about our experience with Hadoop and HBase and some of the things that we've fi we're finding in the marketplace are on our own experiences, as well as what's going on in the marketplace. And then we have a bunch of venture capital guys talking about policy and privacy. So it's all through the day on Sand Hill Road. It should be a lot of fun. Well, John, thanks so much for your time, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks. For information on news of the day and the latest breaking analysis, stay tuned to News Desk right here on SiliconANGLE TV.